in terms of the ability to collect data on the ground in the past year. Um, we are delighted to have a, a diverse group of speakers in front of us today on the topic um, who will bring um, interesting perspectives to the discussion and who have been involved much on, on the innovation side this year. Um, so just to get to our panel of speakers, uh, we have Ariana Legovino, Legovini um, from the World Bank, She's where she has uh, built and uh, leads the Development Impact Evaluation Group. And the unit uses research to improve development practice and policy outcomes. Since joining the bank in 2004, she has worked to engage researchers, operational staff and policymakers in improving the quality um, in the design and implementation of development projects. Um, initially, the, the, the start was made in this work with the creation of the Africa Impact Evaluation Initiative. Um, and it had programs on education, HIV, malaria, community development, agriculture, and the private sector. In 2009, Ariana, Ariana worked um, to import Africa-grown uh, lessons, processes, and programs into the Global Impact Evaluation Program. Um, and um, by 2013, um, she had designed the Impact Evaluation to Development Impact approach to support the expansion of the um, of this evaluation um, across many institutional partners and importantly across under evaluated sectors representing a large share of development aid uh, such as in infrastructure fragility and conflict and public sector governments so we're delighted to have you with us today um, we also have um, Samuel um, Wambi Kamande who is currently the head of data science um, at Azure, the integrated customer experience platform, where he leads a team that provides data support for various product streams and develops new products to drive consumer understanding through advanced analytics and machine learning. He's also a data science curriculum consultant uh, with the Moringa School, where after helping develop the curriculum, he also now um, continuously improves and aligns it to changing uh, Africa data science and dynamics. Um, he holds a master's degree in statistics and a master's degree in computational intelligence from the University of Nairobi. Um, and we also have with us um, um, Iwarsha uh, Kumar, who is a research lead at Busara, the Busara Center for Behavioral Economics. Uh, they have permanent offices in Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, and Tanzania. Um, she leads a lab team with project planning and expanding academic engagements. She's worked in development and experimental economics research across research topics of financial inclusion, behavioral economics, um, and energy and environmental economics. She holds a master's in public administration from NYU. And um, then we have um, Sonia um, uh, Kuguro, um, who is a senior associate and climate lead at 60 Decibels. Sonia has led and contributed to more than 100 lean data projects supporting social enterprises in over 20 African countries with the data insights to improve their business and social impact. She's worked on projects in agriculture, climate change, energy, gender, health, housing and governance. Um, she leads the Climate Re Resilience Group in 60 Decimals. Um, which supports social enterprises in the agricultural space with insights on how to best support their farmers to manage climate change. And finally, we have Matthew Townsend, who is a development economist and a final year PhD student at the University of Cape Town. He's worked at the South African National Treasury, the University of South Africa, and is currently economic consultant to a number of development agencies. Um, Matthew has conducted consulting projects in eight countries and primarily focuses on the design, costing, implementation and monitoring of public policies and programs in middle and low income countries. His thesis develops an optimal road infrastructure investment policy for South, South Africa. Um, so just moving on now to our panel, they're going to discuss the challenges and also the innovative and creative ways in which they and other players have been responding um, to the pandemic and with a particular emphasis on the use of digital technologies and different um, data sources. Um, so thanks a lot. And with that, I'm, I'm going to hand over, I believe um, Ariana is going to begin. Thank you, Emily. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. I hope everybody can see it. 
Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, some of the innovations that came out of uh, our COVID lockdown. Uh, many of these things were in place before, but COVID really gave us a big push in uh, innovating in data usage. So I don't know how many people know, but in the last two years, the world has generated more data than in all of our history combined. This is a pretty exciting um, piece of, uh, uh, of news. Now, the issue here, um, as I always say, is really not the amount of data that is available, but how to go from data to information and from information to action. And so the, the answer is fairly simple, but often uh, not understood, which is the issue is research around that data. And we have two major problems. One is the research capacity is relatively scarce. And second is the financing is not available. Um, within the whole world, for example, of investment, financing a huge amount of resources, but almost non devoted to the basic question of how to maximize the impact of that financing by using rigorous research, adaptive research, the research that allows us to progress much quicker towards the impact that we want to achieve. And so I'm gonna give you a series of examples and I'm gonna go into a little depth into the first example, but then kind of shower you through a whole bunch of other examples to, to just give you a taste of what is possible to do. So the first example is our paper that just came out in PLOS One, where we asked the question of how to meet the challenge of road safety, SDG six, cutting mortality on the roads by half without the data available for doing this. And I'm gonna to talk to Samuel because Samuel is sitting in Nairobi and this is his own city being displayed on the map. And so we went to, to Twitter and consumers and bystanders reports on uh, crashes on the road. And we scraped 850,000 tweets from uh, Math Reroute, a mobile web and SMS platform that helps users share information about traffic and road conditions. And then we use that information and train an algorithm to geolocate those tweets uh, in real time. Now, only one to 2% of those tweets have GPS locations and the others are really just text, such as bed accidents on Waiyaki Way next to Kianda heading towards ABC Place. And so actually training these algorithms is, is a fairly involved process to be able to reach the, um, the uh, necessary outcome of having that dot on a map. And so we created the first crash map of Nairobi that updates in seconds once a tweet goes out. We also went through all of the police stations in Nairobi and digitized their police records to understand what the crowdsourced data tells us um, and what the administrative data uh, tells us. We then merge data with Uber, Google, weather data to create the first data system for the city of Nairobi that provides real-time information on traffic, crashes, and, and uh, potentially all set of events that are reported in, those, in that social media. Now, during, during the, the curfew in Nairobi, we were able to use these data, for example, to see how road safety evolved over the curfews and uh, um, established by the government. To, to find, for example, that crashes fell, injuries fell, but mortality didn't. Um, and if we look time, you know, minute by minute through the data, we find that around the time of the curfew, there is a big spike in uh, crashes and speed because people are trying to get home by the time um, that the curfew takes place. Uh, when we have much greater amount of data, for example, in the case of Bogota, where we have the, the smart card data, we can actually track individual 
movements and mobility and usage of public transit system minute by minute. And we can, for example, uh, analyze the impact of different pricing and subsidy policies on different parts of the population, especially because we have that data merged with socioeconomic data from, uh, uh, from the national agency um, and understand the impact of urban mobility uh, across these different socioeconomics, or what is the impact of a, you know, a COVID crisis on that mobility. In the, again, in the case of Nairobi, we have installed GPS technology in minibuses and provided um, minibus owners with applications to monitor in real time the operations of their drivers. Um, and, and that data comes in again uh, without the need for face-to-face -face interaction. And so we can continue uh, monitoring the um, impact of these, uh, these technologies. In this particular case, a randomized control trial of these monitoring technologies find that the firm profits increased by 13% in, in around six months and that firms are able to expand their fleet. So pretty amazing uh, results for implementing uh, monitoring technologies. I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sure Sonia uh, will like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, um, the other use of big data is collaborations with e-commerce platforms um, that generate a huge amount of data on firm activity and linking consumers to, to suppliers. And so we partnered with one of Africa's largest e-commerce platforms to run a series of randomized control trials to improve firm's usage of the platform, their, their survival rates, and also boost the firm the firm's sales. Um, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, a, in a different setting in Ethiopia, where we are working on uh, road corridors with use of satellite data to, um, to look at the impact of those ro road corridors on economic development, we also work within the industrial parks that are placed around those corridors to understand labor market opportunities, especially for women and poor women uh, from rural areas that are hired in industrial parks. And so during COVID, uh, we analyzed through the use of phone survey, the impact of COVID on employment. As you can see from this chart, um, from employment felt uh, severely during COVID, uh, so only 67% of, um, of employees retained their jobs and the others were either put on leave or, or um, severed altogether. And so kind of having this kind of information in real time also allows our partners, governments to respond and target their social protection uh, interventions across uh, different populations that are suffering as a result of the crisis. Now, in a, in a country like Rwanda, where we have been working for the last 10 years, we uh, set up um, a nationally spatially integrated data systems that merges survey, census, administrative data, and, com and complements uh, the, uh, the data with others that were not available uh, in the country. For example, we collect remotely monthly information on 68 commodities across 150 markets to understand both the, the issues of market integrations, uh, opportunities for, uh, for um, um, improving links to markets, but also to kind of um, predict and the forewarn of impending food crisis. Now, with that information during COVID, we were able to monitor in real time changes in prices across all these commodities with staples actually gaining uh, and increasing, uh, you know, um, we observe increases in prices in basic staples and falls in prices of more luxury um, items such as horticultural uh, produce. Uh, again, this provides um, our clients on, in, on, the, on the ground information about how to target their recovery. Um, passing on to still um, in uh, Rwanda using uh, tax administration data uh, that comes out from electronic receipt we are able to monitor in real time the evolution of uh, uh, economic activity across many different sectors and understand again which sectors are inordinately affected by the crisis and how the government can um, 
target the recovery efforts. Um, still in the area of administrative data, uh, we are working with um, e justice e courts data and make intensive use of artificial intelligence methods to turn unstructured text, uh, which comes, up, comes out of all the court cases, into uh, analyzable data. And the idea is to um, improve the functioning, the efficiency, and the quality of justice processes. When we merge that data with market data uh, from the stock market and other sources of uh, private sector data, we find the um, that there is a causal relationship between the speed of justice and the valuation and revenues of firm. This is, a, this is a, I think, uh, perhaps not as appreciated an effect of justice over private sector functioning. Similarly, we use uh, high frequency transaction data from public e-procurement systems to understand again how to transform the role of public procurement, both making it more efficient and, and uh, securing a lot of fiscal resources for better uses, uh, as well as understanding how the public proc procurement function can support these recovery efforts and target po policy goals. For example, uh, transitioning the countries to uh, a green growth agenda or targeting uh, women-owned enterprises and other, uh, other objectives. In the particular, in some, in some of our cases, we find that very simple reforms, uh, such as one price, uh, adoption of one price for one good, can save uh, uh, countries in the order of 2% of GDP, or that by increasing the productivity and discretion of procurement officers, we can save more than 10% in uh, healthcare expenditures. These are, um, uh, when I say, you know, the research is underfunded, but when research can actually transform the way we deliver uh, on our investments and program, uh, we really need to think about how to fi finance research in a much more proactive and at scale uh, way. So I, uh, I also want to make a, 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 an important point, I think, which is that we can use ubiquitous data, for example, data that comes out of phone records and specifically call detail records, CDRs, to, um, in the case of Afghanistan, to develop a new targeting systems, basically using that data to identify vulnerable populations that should be supported through social protection programs. But the, the issue here is that we were able to do so in the case of Afghanistan because we had five years investments in collecting survey data from the ground. We had massive amount of data that then we could use to calibrate uh, the use of CDR data. And this is, was also the case for, uh, for example, the Twitter data that we used in Nairobi, where we sent out a delivery service sending to actually check whether our algorithm was working in practice. Um, and we, you know, across the world, we have a series of um, uh, mobile apps, like a, such as Safety Pin in uh, Delhi, where, which is used to collect data on uh, um, violence against women, things that are generally hard to measure. Uh, to understand the impact of that violence in the case of Delhi on school choice, in the case of Rio on uh, labor market participation. And, um, and more generally, uh, and, the, and that is the last thing that I'm going to, to mention, we have large partnerships with major social media actors such as Facebook to um, learn how to implement scalable, low cost, effective solution to behavioral change that affects um, uh, our development op uh, opportunities. And for example, we are working on uh, prevention of uh, violence against women. We are working on uh, uh, prevention of malaria or kind of testing and informing targeting of social media campaign to address vaccine hesitation, uh, specifically in the context of COVID. So I'm gonna uh, pass it back to Emily uh, and I hope you found the examples uh, exciting as I do. 
Thank you so much, Ariana. That was very interesting. And, and thanks for all those examples. Um, I'm going to turn now to Samuel. Um, and if you can keep it to nine minutes, we're going to have a little bit more of a, a chance then to discuss following. Just to remind everyone that we have um, a, a space for uh, questions. Um, uh, on And, and please uh, send us any uh, questions you have, and then we'll try to deal with them as um, the discussion unfolds. So thanks again. All right, thanks, Emily. Um, so like Emily mentioned, my name is Kamande. I'm the head of Data Science at Ajua, and Ajua is an integrated customer experience company in Kenya. Um, and our role is pretty much bridging the gap between our businesses and their, custom and, and their customers at the point um, where they, they interact. And we do this by integrating our software in there. Um, a couple of things happened last year that led us to um, actually provide more value to our customers. Um, and, and this was actually contrary to most other businesses. Um, in the sense that we already had the technology um, to connect customers to businesses. Uh, so primarily we run surveys um, as, as the entry point, or either on SMS, WhatsApp, um, or even in web forms, but that is not as, um, that the, the, the uptake of that is not as high um, within this market. Um, this is in Kenya, Nigeria. And, and so one of the things that happened is um, as, as the countries went into the lockdown and um, became quite unsure in terms of how to best um, serve their customers. They increased the range of touch points um, where they interact with their customers. Um, so think of it, of, you know, customers are not coming to your branches anymore if you're a bank. Um, so how do you reach out to them to understand um, the changing dynamics? So one is, um, you know, we were able to integrate into more touch points. Um, so for instance, for, you know, one of the main banks, we are not integrated into all their systems, their mobile banking systems because normally customers would uh, mostly, uh, you know, about 70% of their transactions would happen within the branches. So we ended up having to integrate very quickly um, into their mobile banking systems and, and that will power more conversations around um, what customers are experiencing, um, are experiencing and, and, and build and, and drive that customer experience. That was one. On the other hand, um, Ajua has an audience in the countries that we operate in, an audience meaning a panel, um, in Kenya, that's about 250,000. And, and normally it was a good to have uh, for our business operations. And it was something that we'd normally have as an add-on um, to all our customers in addition to um, what we'd call voice of the customer, which is our main business. But then uh, because of uh, the lack of physical, um, the abandonment of physical surveys and, and the traditional methods of doing research, um, our customers came to us telling us, hey, um, for the, uh, can, can we use your same technology and audience um, to figure out what's happening within the market um, and kind of, uh, you know, layer on top of what we are doing um, in, in terms of our voice of the customer. And so for the first time, uh, you know, in such a long time, um, actually maybe since the inception of the company, this became a huge, huge part of our business and we ended up even bringing in more people to help us with research because typically that was not, um, you know, a bread and butter. Um, and, you know, big organizations in Kenya, um, including, you know, your Safaricoms and your KCBs now were carrying out surveys through our platforms to understand what's happening with the consumers in terms of their different um, challenges and changes in their behavior every two or three days. Uh, because, uh, you know, as all researchers here know, things were, were moving very fast and they still keep doing, uh, keep doing so. Um, so, you know, you're running surveys out to panels of um, uh, samples of 1,000, you know, 2,000, 3,000 every two days uh, because of how fast everything is changing around um, the consumer. Um, that's true. Um, the that shift was around, um, okay, now we, can, um, now we can carry out all these surveys um, but people in the country are undergoing through so much. We're seeing um, a huge, huge drop in employment levels. Um, how can we um, use, uh, you know, our platforms for, for social good? And so we figured out, okay, um, normally when uh, our audiences participate in surveys, they'd get uh, 20 shillings or the equivalent of 20 cents um, in, in a form of an incentive upon completion of a survey. Actually, this is based on something that we've done with Busara a while back. Um, to establish what the right amount is. Um, and so uh, we said, okay, um, how many of these people would be willing to donate that amount instead of getting airtime um, to contribute food to support a family that um, um, needs food? 
because of the hard economic times. So we partnered with um, a company that was providing, um, you know, a plate of food per family every single day called Kwanza Chukule. Um, and you're like, okay, the more we, we do surveys and the more we give incentives, then we give the option of, um, you know, donating that 20 shilling um, to charity to feed the family um, to the respondents. Um, in the first three or four months of doing this, we ended up feeding um, 3,000 families uh, because a plate of food was, uh, they, 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 they had a kitchen and each plate of food um, cost them about 40 shillings um, to make. So if you complete two surveys, then you've actually fed a family. Um, and, and so those two things went hand in hand. Um, and to date, um, we are continuing with um, some of those things that came about because of that pivot. Um, our research arm has actually become um, a lot more significant. Um, we retained a lot of the people that we brought on board to help us drive that. Now it's an active business stream and we're working with organizations, um, not just in Kenya, but in uh, Uganda as well um, and Nigeria um, to help uh, you know, power research. Um, the other thing that you've seen as, as well is um, a lot more, a, a lot more uh, businesses have taken customer experience and the need to have real-time interactions with their customers more seriously. Um, and, and we've seen a significant shift in terms of the turnaround time for you know, our sales team um, out there in terms of um, how fast they actually convert um, all these prospects into deals because now businesses um, understand much better that uh, much more how important it is for them to stay connected with their customers, especially because things are changing so, so quickly. And so that's been a good thing for Joe, but also um, it's a good thing for the ecosystem because um, part of our responsibility is to make sure that customers' voices um, are heard within these organizations and customers always have choices in terms of um, the different products and services that they utilize. Uh, so pretty much being the um, custodians of customer experience within the market um, bo for both businesses as well as, well as um, you know, customers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samuel. I think that was a very interesting perspective and we'd like to come back, I think, in the discussion a little more on um, during COVID and um, with this increased use of surveys that you had and um, how, how, what you were learning about the uh, unfolding um, circumstances. But thanks a lot. Um, so uh, next we will turn to um, Aishwar. Uh, yeah, um, and I'm sorry if I butchered your, uh, your name um, there in my pronunciation, but uh, it, we're very happy to have you here today. Um, and um, let me turn to you next for your comments. Sure. Hi, Emily. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Aishwarya Kumar, and I work at the Busara Center for Behavioral Economics. Uh, we are a research consulting firm and our focus is primarily in the field of behavioral sciences in the global south. Um, and we do uh, a lot of experimental work with researchers, private sector clients, public sector clients. And pre-March 2020, our work was entirely uh, lab experiments, lab in the field experiments. And that really uh, sort of came to a standstill in March 2020. And we had to adapt and recalibrate very quickly uh, in the way uh, we are going to continue and work. So we started by working with clients and really sort of understanding what are the research questions and research designs that they are planning to implement last year and what are the alternatives there. So in terms of advice, we had to internally start, start piloting as well to understand where do we advise to do a phone survey? Where do you say a text message may be more useful uh, to send and where do you do online surveys and which mode to suggest? How do you ensure data quality? Um, how do you ensure that uh, the researcher is satisfied with what you're suggesting? So we were faced with all of these questions and last year was so much learning around that. And what our experience essentially told us, especially for behavioral sciences, was that interventions that are around communication. So if you're sending um, messages or audios and videos and you're asking people to react to that or understand that and see what are the differences in behavior when they receive a certain type of information, uh, how do they react to it and whether that brings about a certain behavior. So as an example, uh, we partnered with a nonprofit called Raising Voices. And this was about violence against women. And basically what in a field experiment would look like in this case was people would play the dictator game, which is essentially I offer you 
100 shillings and you decide how much you allocate uh, of that amount to, towards this uh, nonprofit that's going to help women who have faced violence. And what we did was provide them different types of messaging that if you deal with this or if you provide with this, what this actually means, more decision-making, better education for your children, et cetera. And we compared these different messages to see whether it affected the level of charity that you're willing to do. And this we ran through one of the first tools that I'll talk about for digital technology that we've been using called KITE. KITE stands for Knowledge Insights uh, Tool for Experiments uh, that has been developed internally at Busara last year. And it's a mobile application that you can access through Google Play. And uh, this is essentially for remote data collection where you can create your surveys, uh, you can test polls, uh, you can collect data on this, you can send messages, um, you can upload videos and audios. And essentially it's great for message intervention type of uh, setup. And there's also integrated real-time payments, right? So if you have recruited a set of respondents on this, ad, uh, on this platform uh, that are answering these self-administered surveys through this, uh, through this app, you can also send them money for participation. And the next one, which is closer to uh, the work that we were doing previously is around the virtual lab, which is basically something like a, a Zoom meet where participants join. And essentially this is for interactive games where you need people to interact with each other and do decision-making based on what the other person responds. And we send participants link to join in. And we've, uh, we have successfully conducted this, but there are many learnings here, right? So I think in terms of pros for all of these things, there is a lot of flexibility of like when people can join this and you don't have to stick to certain office hours. So that helps. Uh, it's definitely much more cost effective, remote data collection compared to in-person. Uh, and you can see, reach much larger samples at a much smaller cost. Um, however, there are plenty of challenges that come in the implementation, right? So you have lower response rates than usual, especially compared to in-person, and you have to um, over-recruit and over-sample to kind of deal with some of these things. There's a lot of dropout, especially virtually, because network issues exist everywhere, uh, or people just don't want to participate. So in that sense, it's sort of voluntary that you, I don't want to be here anymore, but the dropout rates become high. And it's also the sample that you're reaching. Uh, a lot of people come to Busara in the countries that we operate to reach very low income populations. And we here to, uh, to have them on Kite or through virtual lab, you're assuming that people have a smartphone or a laptop and they're com comfortable navigating these things, right? Which becomes really hard. So you are in a sense not reaching the lowest income and you have to have access to some of these assets. And there's the question about representativeness. A lot of academics come to us for a representative sample. Uh, what Busara fortunately has is a very large database of uh, respondents already onboarded who have given consent for research in the future. So we can pull from that pool to be able to um, research with them in the future again. So that pool has come in really handy in 2020 for, uh, for conducting experimental research. But it's a sample, right? It's not going to be representative of a community or a tribe or any of these differences that you're trying to do. So you can randomize effectively within that sample, but it's not going to be 100% representative. And of course, implementation of very complex studies where uh, you want to do multiple activities and multiple games, et cetera, is very hard uh, through virtual means. So um, even in terms of like uh, the advice that we've been giving is like, if you're doing like phone surveys, uh, keep it simple, keep it short. There's a huge dropout at like 30 minutes. So try and keep it under that. Uh, even for text messages, providing like incentives, uh, we found has definitely increased uptake by five to nine percentage points if you do that. There are also ethical questions, right? So IRBs needed to be amended to be able to run some of these studies. Uh, they also have concerns around data quality that need to be addressed. So what is it that we are doing more rigorously to ensure that like in the remote data collection phase, or especially with primary data, that uh, are you having more high frequency checks, more back checks? Uh, are you debriefing with your enumerators? Are you talking to the participants in smaller groups uh, to, see, to see whether the quality remains the same? And uh, I think um, one of the interesting things that Busara has done uh, along with consulting on projects is that we want to build um, capacity of behavioral scientists and people who are interested in this field. Uh, and we've been doing that by collaborating with universities and organizations that are interested in having this capacity internally uh, by running like 
courses with them. Uh, so as an example, with Swarthmore College, which is in the US, we ran a semester course with them, with students where their final project were uh, basically experiments. And they were told that this will run remotely by a kite and uh, Busara would Im implement it. So what we did throughout the semester was work with the students, giving them advice on how to have simpler research questions. How do you make sure that these can be implemented remotely um, and really uh, helping them think through like going from theory to practice in a sense. And we are implementing some of those as Busara. And um, there are other with MIT Cub Lab, with the University of Chicago. These have been like North-South collaborations. In terms of South-South collaborations, we've also worked with BX Arabia. And we are hoping that we, uh, you know, work more and more with like Global South researchers uh, and expand uh, both like um, the, the pool of behavioral scientists and get people interested on your own. So we are really at Busara hoping that these trends remain for longer. Uh, small amounts of field work, lab work will begin to resume, but we do want to keep remote data collection as a, as a viable option, primarily because it's economical. Also, we think that for exploratory work with PhD students, et cetera, who have smaller budgets in a sense, it's a useful tool to have to get some initial data, at least starting to understand the landscape that's out there. And then for the main studies, they can think more about how to use this data. But it's, I think, very useful for that. And of course, like the intercultural uh, trainings and uh, a very intentional and explicit values of different cultural perspectives is something that Busara really stands for. And we hope that it keeps going in the way we have been uh, collaborating with different organizations. So thank you so much, everyone, for your time. And back to you, Emily. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, so next, we're going to uh, turn to uh, Sonia Kuguru to um, discuss a bit the work that 60 Decibels has, has been doing. Um, so with that, I'll hand over. Great. Thank you, Emily. And hello out there to all of you. My name is Sonia Kuguru. I am a senior associate and the climate lead at 60 Decibels. Uh, 60 Decibels is an impact measurement and management firm, and we support various impact players, whether they be social enterprises, funds, impact investors, with data to understand and improve their, their impact. Uh, in case you're wondering, and I'm sure you are, 60 Decibels is the average volume of human conversation, and our name really reflects one of our business's North Stars, which is listening. Um, we started this work uh, maybe six or seven years ago at the Acumen Fund, uh, really our parent, um, supporting the portfolio of Acumen's uh, of social enterprises with insights to more impactfully deploy Acumen's capital. While at Acumen, through you know, years of trial and error, we developed an approach to doing this work, which we call Lean Data. Uh, using mobile technology and lean survey tools, we quickly and cost effectively support enterprises to, in listening to their respondents, amassing high quality data, and using those insights to advise social enterprises, but also the industry on how to best enhance um, its, their impact. Over the years, we generated a lot of interest from Acumen's co-investors and others across the industry, and we spun out Lean Data in 2019 and uh, independently started this company, 60 Decibels, to scale our approach. To date, uh, we've worked with over 300 companies through 600 projects, and we've spoken to um, nearly 200,000 uh, 200, people across the globe. So just a few notes uh, before I discuss how COVID affected us and how we pivoted during this time. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about how we do what we do um, and how we collect all this data and generate these insights. So the first thing is that nearly all of our work is conducted via phone, um, primarily phone call. Um, and sometimes we do also utilize text and IVR uh, for, our, for our surveys. Secondly, and you know, really a major tool that powers all of our work is our global research teams. We work with over 700 enumerators or researchers around the globe who speak local languages, they understand local contexts, and they actually are the data collectors. Um, and, and really, you know, I think of them as the vehicle of our work. The third tool in how our work happens 
is our surveys. I, I know Aishwarya has mentioned this already, but the leanness of our work is visible in our actual surveys, which last 15 to 20 minutes. Thirty minutes. Okay, so we had you back. We oh, can hear you. Yeah. Oh dear. It's just a, a brief me? blip, so it's fine. Okay. Well, I'll just continue on then. Um, I was just mentioning how lean our work is, and that's really visible in the shortness of our survey tools and our questions. Now, the last thing I wanted to mention is that. As a result of all of this data that we've been able to collect and all these interviews and conversations that we've been able to have, it's all allowed us to generate a benchmark, which is, you know, I've talked about one of our North Stars being listening. And really the second uh, North Star is we are really focused on ordinal impact. We are focused on comparison and standardization and our benchmark allows us to do this. Um, we found and we believe over time that comparison generates in interest in our data and people take uh, a deeper investment in how they, you know, in data when they understand and contextualize themselves against others and when they can measure their own performance against the industry. And, and this particular approach we have found affects people in a different way when they see their data presented um, in a standardized measured way than just in the one dimensional way of here's here's just how you did. Um, so we we are really focused on here's how you do it, how you're doing, but here's also how you're doing compared to your peers. Now, in terms of COVID and, you know, just thinking about um, what Samuel Adajua had said, uh, the number one thing we found in COVID is that because of how we work, we really didn't have to change our data is already collected remotely, 95% of it is on the phone, and it's therefore already COVID-19 safe. And so the meat of our business did not have to change, um, and fundamentally, things stayed the same. Just as a quick example, um, we, we actually believed that we'd have to pivot at the beginning. Um, one hypothesis that we had was that our response rates would change. We weren't even sure if they would change in a positive or a negative way. Some members of our team thought we'd see more responses because people are at home more. Uh, while other folks, there was a second camp of folks who thought folks would be too busy or less interested um, in, in participating in a survey. But what we found was that the response rates stayed steady. If you compare the performance uh, in response rates from February to April, 2019, to February to April 2020, both, both time periods, our response rates were just upwards of 60%, which, meant that, which means that 60% of the time, folks pick up the phone and complete an interview with us. So we were happy to find that there really wasn't um, much of an impact on our phone surveys. And as a result, um, we were over, you know, over the course of 2020 alone, we've been able to collect COVID insights from over 50,000 people in 32 countries. Um, but there are two areas where we did make some changes. The first area is in the content of our work. Um, our, you know, prior to COVID-19, our work was primarily focused on the relationship between the respondent and the company that serves them, uh, that commissioned us. And the, the one way in which that changed is we began to include COVID, broad COVID questions in all of our surveys. Um, we developed a, a short six question module, which we deployed across every study that we con, uh, conducted in 2020. And that study served, that module served to both provide insight on the COVID-19 lived experience for our respondents, but it also served as a way to more empathetically reach respondents during what was at the beginning and still a scary and challenging time. Um, and the second way in which our content changed is we began to roll out COVID surveys alone. Um, we began mass listening campaigns around the world, uh, some of which are still ongoing, to understand the impact of COVID-19 and more importantly, 
what folks need to cope during this pandemic. We've been using this, this COVID data to support funds and enterprises and governments um, with responses uh, for folks at the bottom of the pyramid. Now, putting content aside, the second way in which we've changed um, was really to manage the rigor and representativeness of our studies. Um, and really that's been reflected in how we manage and train our remote research teams. Obviously we've limited all in-person gatherings. Um, we used to meet our researchers in person, train them in person, um, or, or give deliver an online training where they would all meet in a, in a capital city to, to consume that training. But we now only conduct online trainings. We have essentially cleaned up our entire training process. We've developed a standard online curriculum. Any of our researchers around the globe can take any of our courses, whether that's on you know, basic research ethics to conducting a study with farmers. Um, and we've also introduced a new module um, for, it's both for our researchers to better understand how to manage having harder conversations on the phone, uh, how to manage their own emotions, but also tips and guidance for how researchers can manage more challenging uh, conversations for the sake of respondents. Now, um, I, I do want to, to mention that uh, mirroring what Samuel said is the last area that we've seen a big difference in this COVID period is, is also an interest. And I feel, I'm feeling very affirmed right now, Samuel. Um, but you know, we used to perceive a slight prejudice against phone surveys. And now we are seeing a lot more interest and in understanding in the power of collecting data on the phone and how high quality and rigorous that data can be. Um, as a result of that, um, you know, we've been able, to, we deployed our first COVID study uh, with the support of our clients in April, on April 1st of 2020. Um, and, you know, to, in order to support um, other players and practitioners in, in the space, uh, replicate this methodology and also move on developing more phone surveys, deploying more phone surveys. We've also published um, the 60 decibels remote surveying toolkit which should support folks in getting work like this off the ground. We really would love to see more folks in the space doing this work. And we have shared with our hosts um, and with GDN the link to that toolkit so that any of you can um, start, start doing these phone surveys tomorrow. Um, so uh, that's just a little bit of background on 60 decibels and, and also how COVID has affected our work. Thanks a lot, Sonia. Um, that's very interesting. Um, um, we'll come back, I think, in the Q&A to some questions that you've just got in on your presentation. Um, just, but finally, to turn now to uh, Matthew Townsend um, to join us to give. Uh, yeah, I think Matthew's there. Um, yeah, perfect. Perfect. But thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone, for being here. The question which uh, was just posed by Andrea to Sonia, and I think I can, I can weigh in on that as well later on in the Q&A, um, because I, the research which myself and, and another research completed for the EIB and the GDN program, um, we actually partnered with 60 decibels um, and we had an interesting research experience, but I'll save um, that specific project um, for the Q&A session. What I wanted to use my time now for, and sort of the general question being, how has COVID um, affected uh, the work that I do um, as a researcher? I wanted to uh, introduce a few high-level um, sort of impacts, which, which I've seen um, affecting my work, which I, I think will resonate with a lot of the participants um, in, this, in this webinar and hopefully start to sort of get questions and, and, and input from, from other researchers um, on, this, on this forum as to how they're seeing that and play out and, and also how they're dealing with it. So the, the two projects which I'm going to be sort of talking to in terms of the experience that I've had over the last year in researching under COVID. Uh, the first is a project uh, which we've done for UNICEF in Uzbekistan. 
and we've been looking at reforming their child benefit system. Um, the second um, project which I've been involved with um, is also for UNICEF, and it's a rapid situation analysis of how COVID has affected education um, sectors in the South Asian countries. So what I'm going to be talking to is what I've seen happening in those projects. And as I said, I think a lot of the other researchers would have seen these, um, these points playing out as well. Uh, the first is the emphasis um, which I'm seeing uh, coming on to the due diligence um, area um, of our work. Um, previously, obviously, it was important. Um, to a large extent, uh, a lot of that was taken for granted um, in many projects uh, previously. Um, what you sort of I've seen increasingly is very strong pressure from stakeholders um, to provide quick responses um, to COVID-19 and to develop new policies and um, necessary responses and to start building back um, systems better and to start building back these systems in very uncertain um, environments. So all of that puts a massive emphasis on the due diligence component um, of the work we do that of, um, in terms of impact and, and evaluation. So just in terms of the, the Uzbekistan um, project, uh, sort of prior to COVID, it would have been a, a reasonably simple exercise where um, there was 2018 household survey data that was available. Um, it would have been a sort of Part of the exercise would have been a sort of difference and difference analysis, looking at your control and treatment groups, um, and sort of looking at how that grant had performed and how we think it could be optimally uh, sort of reformed going forward, um, sort of for a, a long term change to the system. However, um, COVID has completely changed um, the environment. Um, in Uzbekistan and in, in, in almost all countries. Um, so now what you had was a very difficult um, environment in terms of trying to identify um, how many people we think are going to be um, sort of potential recipients. So how do we now address the targeting um, of that grant? That became a much more difficult um, question. We also had um, more difficult questions posed in terms of what should be the optimal values of those grants. A lot was changing in terms of households income status. Um, a lot was changing in terms of households consumption patterns. Um, a lot was changing in terms of employment um, status. And then not just short term, but how are those going to evolve over the medium and long term, bearing in mind that what you're developing is essentially um, long-term systems um, where they're not easy to uh, sort of make quick changes to. So in that instance, due diligence uh, was critical um, and became a much more important element um, to, to the work. In terms of the uh, rapid situation analysis for the education sectors, um, their due diligence is, is also critical and uh, sort of will grow um, in importance as the conversation around um, online learning um, starts to sort of develop even more from, from where it is now. Um, a lot of countries have gone through uh, sort of full um, school closures and with their students being out of school, um, there've been sort of varying degrees of success with online um, teaching systems and a lot of lessons which we can start to to get from those um, now sort of the and from a due diligence perspective it's about trying to match up um, sort of the lessons that we've learned um, from those online learning systems um, within the countries and then also the international lessons and um, to sort of get some sort of sensible recommendations in terms of how countries can start to transition um, to, to online learning. Um, as I say, there's a lot of pressure to now start developing um, those policies seem to be sort of communicated from a political perspective. But I think also very challenging is a lot of countries, um, what's come out of that situation analysis is we've been looking at the, the financial implications um, of COVID-19 on, on education budgets. 
and countries' ability to reach SDG 4 um, by 2030. And it's increasingly looking likely that um, a lot of countries are um, under kind of the likelihood of them missing SDG 4 is even higher. So what are the benefits that could come from online learning and how those could bring down human costs? Um, countries are wanting to start to, to put together these policies, um, but a lot of the lessons learned are in developing countries, uh, like developed countries. How do those then translate over to developing countries? And what are the useful lessons um, that we can start to, to now draw from those systems? So that's what I've seen from a, a due diligence perspective. Um, the, Last sort of high level um, experience which I've had, which, which I'd like to raise prior to the Q&A um, and conversations with, with the other panelists is what we've seen in terms of the monitoring of, of existing programs. And this one, I may look specifically at, at what we've looked at in, in the education sector, but it's kind of the trade-off between um, putting in or being able and to do the requisite um, research to get to accurate results versus coming up with um, dynamic sort of rapid responses, being able to constantly change um, and update with the situation. Uh, I think in the sort of six months that we've been working on the education analysis, we must have updated it six times. Um, every month, um, something changes in terms of what countries have done um, in terms of duration of, of lockdowns and um, new data is coming in um, and new data which is starkly contrast to, to the information that we had before. And so we're seeing drastic findings now coming out as the information comes in. Um, things like um, in the Philippines, there's been 25% um, of student dropouts um, from pre-primary to the upper secondary. And now that's much more dramatic than we've seen uh, in other sort of crises um, where, where research had been done. So it's about sort of in the, the current sort of crisis uh, research environment and um, finding that correct balance between uh, sort of rigorous um, research and also sort of being able to be dynamic. Um, and in that sense, what, what we have focused on and the work that we've developed is developing um, dynamic models, uh, which are mostly focused on identifying key variables, uh, sort of coming up uh, sort of with relationships um, that are justifiable, and then spending most of our effort on, on doing stress testing. Um, and then as things begin to calm down, um, then sort of shifting back to your traditional um, sort of focus which is which is much more on, on sort of your accuracy of results but at the moment i think it's what we've seen is it's more about being able to provide inputs to policy and operational discussions and um, and not necessarily being sort of on the button but being in the ballpark and um, so that you can give guidance to to conversations um, sort of informed guidance conversations then I think sort of the last few points, um, which I'll sort of just also briefly mention, but um, say for, for the next round of questions and Q&A, is the difficulties that, that we've had in terms of how the operational environment has changed. So traditionally, um, a large component of my work was traveling and, and in-country um, trips. Um, but that has that has fallen away um, to a large degree with a lot of the uh, travel restrictions um, based in South Africa. And as many people know, we have a <laughs> pretty bad variant um, of, of COVID-19. So, so the travel restrictions that have been imposed on us have been um, extreme. So we've had to adapt um, to how we undertake our work. Um, and we have remodeled the relationship that we have been trying to build with in-country um, national consultants, um, shifting more from a capacity and a development um, focus, which we had in terms of working with national consultants, um, which that hasn't fallen away, but it's to a large degree um, been sort of necessitated for us to replace with 
in-country experts um, and teams with in-country experience. Um, and that's how we've ended up partnering with, um, from a research perspective, with 60 decibels. Um, and um, yeah, and sort of the way, the way we've reacted to, uh, to our other projects as well. So I'd like to just leave it, um, leave it there in terms of my sort of high level um, sort of take on how COVID has, has impacted uh, the work environment that I see as a researcher. And um, yeah, I look, forward, look forward to the discussion. So thank you very much, Matthew. Um, so, sorry. Uh, please, everyone, note that uh, you know the Q and A is open, and we're looking at your questions. We're now going to start uh, introducing those to the panel. But if you uh, would like to add there, that would be great. Um, I'm not sure someone was trying to come in, but no, and I uh, spoke over them. Not sure if uh, if they want to come in now. Okay. Uh, well, with that, actually, I will turn to the question that Matthew has posed for our panel, which I think is. Uh, a very valid one, which is, you know, given the current situation, what are the trade-offs um, between the ability to continue um, collecting data, the rapidity of that data collection, and the valid validity of the, these alternative data collection modes? What have we been learning as this crisis unfolds? And, you know, at this stage, what are our takeaways on that? Um, and maybe on that, um, I can start off with Aishwarya. Um, if you'd like to um, take that, because you've been discussing a little bit the Busara approach. Sure. Uh, thanks, Emily. Yes, so I think there are uh, definite trade-offs and concerns around that, about which mode of data collection that you use. And I think uh, along with external partners, we have internally been doing our own pilots, right, to see sort of what is it that, that works or hasn't been working. So in fact, um, with one researcher in South Africa only, we did a, an RCT where we compared uh, phone surveys with in-person surveys to find like how much of, uh, is there a difference in the data quality there and the outcomes and the quality of information that we are getting there. And we didn't find like a significant difference there, which really sort of helped us uh, give confidence in that, okay, this can be done, uh, you know, using phone surveys and the data quality is pretty substantial. With, with text messages, uh, we tried that last year for the first time. It, previously, it was mostly used as reminders or invitations to sort of participate in studies, et cetera. We had never like actually done like surveys over text messages where you send a bunch of questions and get answers. And we found that overall, like the, the patterns followed like a, a reasonable distribution uh, compared to like previous in-person data collection that we found. Small in incentives definitely helped in participation. So in basically getting better response rate and completion rates. So like uh, a small incentive does affect by like nine percentage points. And then I think describing the length of the survey at right at the beginning that you are going to answer 10 questions or 20 questions is going to take you so much time has really helped kind of uh, improve the, the way that pa the participants who are doing this now on their own, uh, you can't really be there and help them uh, have, uh, have really helped out. But I would still say that the nature of your study and the research questions that you're trying to answer um, still need like inform this so these are yes in these studies it worked but i think there is always like a case to be made for like types of questions for example in one study uh, we wanted participants to download an app right and they weren't able to even with like virtually uh, going through an entire explanation etc the response rate was really low uh, the download rate was really low and it took uh, what we had anticipated in field would be like a month's <laughs> activity then became like over multiple months where uh, a, more recruitment needed to be done we had to like if previously we oversampled by like twice the sample that we are trying to hit now we are at like three four times to reach the target sample so if you want like 500 respondents for your study we are recruiting at the time of recruitment like closer to 2000 2500 so i think there are some sort of uh, trade-offs here that need to be considered and which mode do you think would be uh, best for you so absolutely very valid questions and i think it is a bit of a case-by-case -case basis but these are some of the examples that we experience excellent thank you very much i'm not sure if sonia wants to come in here I and mean, we had an online related question on uh, to what extent could the quick emergency service be relied upon? And I know that you, you have had a lot of experience with this in 60 decibels, so perhaps you can uh, give uh, some comments on that. Yes, for sure. I think 
we really pride ourselves on that that uh, value of speed. Um, because we work on the phone, because we work with a lot of private sector folks, working in real business time is something that, um, you know, that's really our calling card. Um, but of course, like every methodology in our space, there are limitations. We've already discussed limitation on um, the amount of data that you can collect. When you're doing data collection on the phone, you really need to be keen on prioritization. You can't collect everything on a 20 minute phone call. I think the secondary thing is, you know, we, all, we absolutely recognize that while phone is perfect for some situations, it's not perfect for all situations. You know, I, I work in the agriculture space primarily. I work in the, in the climate space. And I recognize there are some data points you cannot collect over the phone. I cannot collect the dairy stocking rate on the phone, I have to come to your farm. I cannot collect you know, the tree cover by acre on the phone because we found that even with farmers whose bread and butter is a tree related produce like you know, uh, macadamia nuts, they will not know the number of trees they have uh, for the, on average. Uh, and so we also are very careful about what we ask on the phone. But in, you know, from you know, the data that we've collected and the testing that we've been doing over time, we do recognize that what we do collect on the phone and the conversations that we have is invaluable um, for, for the folks that we serve because the, the conversation is not, should we do an RCT? Should we do a phone survey? Should we do an in-person survey? It's, should we get some very high quality data or should we stay with no data? And for most of the folks that we're serving, having access to, to data that's high quality and addresses your key learning priorities allows you to make decisions um, where you would not been have been able to make infor an informed decision. Um, so, you know, certainly, and, and Matt, I, I, Matthew, pardon me, I, I'd love to hear your response and if I've answered your question, but, um, you know, we, we re you know, for what we do, um, we know that we can collect high quality data on the phone in a quick way. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Matthew for uh, his response. Yes, no, um, so, so I think, I I think that the end result that, that we achieved with, uh, with 60 decibels was, uh, was a good outcome given the circumstances. So in, in terms of the, the just to sort of quickly give an outline of, of the project that we've done um, as part of our EIB GDN research project is we were looking at how an online distribution platform in Nigeria um, was affecting the price of consumer goods um, for staple household products being sold by small retailers in, in Nigeria. Now, we had under the start of the project pre COVID, and we had um, gone through our initial um, sort of research methodology um, exercise, um, sort of under that context, where we had identified um, a sample and we developed a survey which we were going to implement um, face to face with. Um, yeah, with sort of uh, field workers going to the stores and um, gathering a lot of the information just by looking at prices on the shelves, um, which would be uh, sort of the most reliable indication of, of what the exact prices for those goods were. Um, and that's how we, we had planned the research. Uh, COVID, uh, COVID had then um, obviously came along and uh, everything had to change. Uh, the first change um, that we saw happening is that when we switched from what we were expecting to be uh, field workers visiting um, to a physical stores, physically visiting stores um, to a shift to online, uh, to shift to telephone interviews, uh, which was the approach that, that, that we've gone with, uh, we immediately had to increase our sample size. Um, so that was the first change which we had to make um, up front. Um, we then started, um, in terms of the pilot survey, and I think this speaks to, to the question that, that Andrea had answered, and how does uh, sort of 60 decibels is sort of in-country team of, of sort of researchers assist 
is we obviously, um, I've done quite a few projects in Nigeria and I've spent quite a lot of time in country. Um, so I'm familiar with the cultural um, sort of environment. Um, but I, I also, it's, it's not my, my typical environment. So a lot of those nuances and how that's going to affect how the surveys go um, needed to be brought into the survey. Um, so what we were seeing with, within the questions that you were asking, um, there's a lot of, and this is just a general sort of very high level, big generalization, but there's a lot of uh, sort of trust issues um, related to phone related surveys in Nigeria, a lot of issues with um, prices, and there's a lot of scam um, type activity um, which goes on. So when it came to questions about the prices of um, of goods um, and profits of companies, the margins that they were charging, et cetera. Where in a sort of a face-to-face -face environment and sort of having something installed would be relatively easy to collect. And over the phone, a lot of complications started to arise. Um, so we went through various iterations with the 60 decibels team who had sort of in-country experts uh, to work out how we needed to adapt the survey. And then in addition to having to increase the sample size, we also have to reduce the number of questions. And then in analyzing the questions, we also have to then have a look at which ones um, sort of were still valid. And so we had a sort of a very interactive um, engagement with them. Um, and as I say, in the comment that I've made earlier, um, national consultants are becoming increasingly um, more important. Um, and uh, yeah, and sort of that, uh, cultural um, uh, sort of environment um, it needs to be a lot of inputs um, and especially if when you're talking about a situation where data needs to be collected rapidly and there's not a lot of time for multiple rounds of pilot phases you've got sort of one go um, and then you need to sort of be in your final your final um, survey tool so that, that, that was the experience that we had um, on our on our recent project and our engagement um, uh, with the 66, 60 decibels um, sort of model that Sonia had it, had it at the start. Thank you, Matthew. Sorry, and and building on that, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. If I may, I mean, thank you, Matthew, for sharing your experience. And, and I, you know, having not worked on that project, I really can't speak to it. But, you know, what you've said at the end there is really our sweet spot, which is if you need data quickly, if you want to make a change, if you want to make a pivot, you know, particularly at the beginning of COVID, a lot of folks were reverting to us because they wanted to understand what's happening on the ground. Will my customers be able to pay their loan back? Will my customers, will my farmers be able to access the market so that they can feed their families? And really that's our sweet spot. Um, but, you know, I, I will say that, you know, some of the uh, challenges that you mentioned, and, and I know Aishwarya has mentioned them as well, around response rates, folks, you know, being wary to pick up the phone. One thing that we do, um, and we, we have partnered with Ajua, um, formerly M Survey, on this before, but before making a call, we found that if you send a quick test text message, either yourself, uh, you know, your company, or uh, the actual, the company with the relationship to the respondent, if you send them a quick message before you call, let them know you are calling. That really can support your response rates and improve the legitimacy of your exercise. So um, that's that's something that we've done systematically for years now. Um, and, and we'd love to see other folks replicating the same. No, thanks a lot, Sonia. Um, so just like building on this discussion, Ariana, um, we had an online question, I think, related to the the the, um, the the issue of the importance of the local context that Matthew was bringing up, um, and that's do do we think there's going to be a resurgence in the use of um, our, and the role of local researchers in collecting data and doing analysis um, in the light of the COVID pandemic, or indeed in response to the lessons that we've learned from the COVID pandemic? And this is of course a bit uh, core to the lessons we're drawing from. Um, the value that we've had um, following this approach in the GDN EIB program. So, Ariana, it'd be great to hear from you. Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely yes. Um, but not only because of COVID, but more generally. 
Um, so we have we are a relatively large research group working in development finance, and we have capabilities that are not uh, usually available to many other researchers around the world. So we do um, place um, building capacity for research all over the world as one of our priorities. Um, we build capacity both from the demand and supply side. What I mean by that is that we um, um, find it fundamental to build capacities in governments, agencies, and firms to understand what research services they need and how to judge the quality of those research services that they may contract. And at the same time, build capacity from the research side to ensure that they can meet uh, high quality standards. There is nothing worse than the wrong answer coming out of poor research, guiding us in the wrong direction. And so the, you know, from, from, um, uh, so we ourselves are organized as a, as a lab kind of transitioning from kind of the micro enterprise of, of uh, research into a, you know, a, a structured um, delivery of at scale research. And as part of that, we create a lot of products that we made available open source to all the researchers around the world. Um, just to give you an example, in, in April, 2020, uh, we halted face to face field work because of the crisis. And our Diamond Analytics team helped um, our teams transition to phone surveys. In that process, we developed guidelines for safe and effective remote data collection, which we made available um, to, to everyone. And we developed uh, COVID-19 modules to add to the surveys to track um, the impact of the crisis on uh, firms, households, and others. Uh, more recently, we developed guidelines for safe resumption of face-to-face uh, surveys. And again, we made those available. We do have uh, a dime wiki, which actually Nairobi is the number one user of. Um, the dime wiki is a, basically a handbook of everything that you need to know for data collection and impact evaluation analysis. And uh, it is a wiki, so uh, it allows everybody to contribute um, their thoughts, ideas, and links. Uh, we also provide, uh, feel, you know, develop and provide uh, toolkits and field kits for others to use. In some cases, we have run summer schools. Uh, for example, in Kigali, we ran an exciting summer school uh, associated with their PhD program. Uh, we brought, you know, a big team to Kigali and uh, worked with the local professors and the uh, local uh, and junior researchers to develop their skills. We even hired um, the two best students out of that program. Um, so yes, we have absolutely a huge interest in supporting the development of research all over the world. And we collaborate with so many research centers everywhere. Um, and so we, we are really open uh, if any Anyone is interested to, to collaborate, find ways of uh, expanding your capa capacities, helping us expanding ours. Uh, we are really open and look forward to those interactions. Thank you very much. Um, and Ariane, another question that you'd answered uh, online, but I think it's interesting for us to reflect on is um, what we can learn about, you know, as IFIs, but also other engaged institutions in being more prepared in the future. Um, I mean, I guess this should make our systems more resilient, but you make the point that we should have probably expected this. Um, so I think your thoughts on that would be useful in terms of future directions for monitoring, investing in local resources, prioritizing online training and um, maybe what your, your takeaway is that on an action plan um, to, to get more ready to be resilient in the face of crisis on the impacts. Right, so I mean, the, the issue of being prepared as, you know, globally uh, as institutions for managing a crisis. So I'm, I'm gonna park that a little bit and kind of focus on the data and monitoring side of uh, managing those crises. We are fully unprepared. Um, <laughs> the, we, we were caught by surprise for something that should not have been a surprise. Of course, we had 
many pandemics more localized. Uh, we knew that this would be coming. A lot of people had said so, um, but you know, there is nothing better than a crisis to focus everybody's attention. Now, what happens in this crisis is also quite interesting from the research side, because this is the first time we saw, um, you know, huge collaboration across many different research centers and, you know, everybody focused on developing a solution. Uh, the vaccine experience, some people have said that we have made 12 year progress on vaccine development in just one year. Um, so the, the issues here are that we always consider research, you know, a little bit of uh, kind of, uh, you know, a disorganized, disorganized conglomeration of different ideas coming somehow together into something that is coordinated and, and focused on what we need, but a little more coordination and a, a greater understanding of where we should be focusing our efforts so that we can all advance much quicker. Um, this is something that comes clearly out of, out of uh, this crisis. Now, in terms of data capabilities, um, where, where, were we, where were we able to provide a response which was timely and, and targeted to the needs, in, in our case, mainly of governments trying to provide a policy response, was the situations where we had invested in capabilities for the last 10 years. Those capabilities are not doing a randomized control trial somewhere. Those capabilities are working with many institutions in a country and build systems that are actually, you know, national systems or citywide system that are combined. They don't use just survey data. Survey data, in a way, we, what we have learned in this crisis is that survey data was overused, that there are dozens of other sources of data and that the power of our work is based on integrating different sources of data and understanding how to develop data systems that are cost effective, high frequency and really target what, you know, the, the measure, the set of measurements that we need to advance and make that that data actionable for the people who can take decisions over it. And so survey data will still be necessary but it will be necessary for a subset of things that we cannot gather from any other more effective and efficient methods of data collection. The face-to-face -face model is costly, is extremely costly, but we have today so many other ways. Now, because there is bias in every source of data, kind of integrating and triangulating different types of data, doing a lot of research to understand. So, you know, if I look at data science research, sometimes they don't worry about what that data does not cover. So injustice is a very clear example. So when we have bias in a way, different populations are targeted for law enforcement, then the data we get out of the justice system is biased against those group of people who are discriminated against. And so when we look at statistics, those statistics are not true. They are biased because of the way we generate the data. So kind of understanding the, the data generation process, understanding how to interpret any data set in a way that allows us to not draw conclusions too quickly uh, and kind of triangulating and building these integrated data systems to actually aim towards kind of an unbiased and universal set of data that then we can use to draw policy conclusions and actions. This is, I think, uh, one of our priority. Financing, again, from development institutions and is not available to build these data capabilities. It, it's really a kind of an afterthought and we need to be much more focused on understanding how to finance the data infrastructure that will allow us in the future to be much more responsive and much more able to manage our crisis. Thank you, Ariana. Um, and related to this again, um, Sam, Sam, sorry, hi. Thanks a lot. 
In relation to this, Samuel, um, you had discussed a bit how um, Adua had changed, um, had changing demand from clients and companies, um, of course, related to the crisis and how uh, you had, uh, you know, unrolled uh, different uh, data science tools uh, to respond to that. Maybe looking forward, it would be interesting for you to think how this is kind of maybe given a jump start to data science in the type of um, services that you provide to clients. And what this maybe means for um, how you're going to work in the future. And if you have any takeaways from the last year, longer term, that would be uh, useful. Yeah, so it's not necessarily a change, more um, uh, an emphasis on one particular product stream. Um, so like I said, our main uh, day-to-day -day is based on customer experience, where we power integrated customer experience for organizations. Um, through integrations into their different platforms through which they interact with customers. But now with an increased level of uh, more consumer research, so this is looking at consumers outside of your ecosystem, um, and, and being able to run that at a higher frequency relative to how you do it traditionally. Um, so meaning that um, if you're a bank, um, normally you're engaging customers every day to get feedback about how they're experiencing your product. Now you can do the same thing um, with the rest of the consumers um, out there who are um, could either be your customers and and you know just figuring out how they're um, interacting with other products outside um, or they could not be your customers entirely uh, but they're giving you a constant pass of what's happening within um, the consumption ecosystem and and so being able to um, have the same level of frequency of those conversations as you would um, internally, because we've been able to drive those internal conversations um, and drive very high frequency data um, for, for your customers. So th that's definitely changed. Um, and, and it's going to um, continue. We are seeing it already in 2021. Um, so for instance, a bank, in addition to um, continuously collecting feedback from their customers, they're also running more, more surveys to the general consumers, if you may. Um, uh, you know, every week or every um, couple of weeks, um, it's a, at a higher frequency than we've ever seen. And I mean, that's very, very important because Africa is already dynamic enough, um, or, you know, Sonia and the rest of the guys have spoken about it. Uh, it's already dynamic enough. Now you layer the pandemic on top of that and the complexity just, you know, uh, grows tenfold. And, and so you need to, uh, I don't think there's, it's ever been more important to um, have a constant um, understanding of um, the consumption dynamic, especially for a profit company. Um, so, you know, that's definitely the, the, the biggest change we're seeing. Okay, no, thank you, Samuel. I think that's a, a nice and positive um, end, actually, to our discussion today is just that uh, uh, we may see, uh, you know, a continuation of these dynamics over the past year. And I think there's been some very nice messages um, from today's panelists on that. Um, so with that, we'd like to thank everyone for your time. Um, it's been very useful for us at the EIB um, to learn from all of these approaches and um, take those to our project work. Um, so again, have a, have a nice rest of the day, good weekend, um, and thanks on our side. Um, we'll be um, posting some of this information online. I think you can see in the chat some links already to some of the background resources. Um, and we hope we've given you a flavor of some of the work that's been going on um, um, from our speaker's side. Um, but uh, great to have you with us today. Thank you, everybody. And Thank you very much. To the Thank recording you. of the webinar today on our social media. So that should be up hopefully by Monday. Wonderful. And thanks, Ramona, and everyone at GDN for a fantastic organization. Thank you. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Right, thank you to everyone. No, thank you, Emily. Good job. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>